It's interesting that chapter 18 of The Mandalorian, episode 2 from season 3, is much longer than the premiere. Usually the premiere is the one that's really long. This episode clocked in at about 44 minutes. If you take away the uh, credits, it's probably about 38, 39. And I feel like that was probably a bit closer to what they were aiming for with the first episode. But I feel like the first episode, and I could be wrong about this, but I think it might have been Favreau and Filoni kind of like getting their feet wet once again into this Mandalorian world. Also, I want to discuss a real quick comment that was made by Hello Greedo about that first episode. He was talking about how it's dumb that they showed the Grogu reunion that began at the end of season two when he leaves with Luke and finishes when he chooses to go back to the Mandalorian in the book of Boba Fett. In the book of Boba Fett, people are probably... Like, a lot of people are casuals. They don't even watch Book of Boba Fett. Some just have heard The Mandalorian. Like, that's the brand that people are into. The Mandalorian. So, he made a great point about how I do feel like it was a mistake. For us, okay, we saw it all. We're here. We're hardcore fans. We can Google stuff up. We can figure out what's going on. But for the casuals, they were probably like, well, how did that happen? Are we missing something? And that does make sense. But let's go ahead and get to chapter 18, season 3, episode 2. The last episode really did set up the season. Din Djarin wants to go back to Mandalore. His mission is to bathe in the waters beneath the surface to atone for his sins of unmasking, which is very much against the Mandalorian code of ethics, or their, their code, I guess, of warrior, their warrior's code. This takes Dean Jaren back to Tatooine where he's trying to get that part for the droid from this first season that he needs to sort of re rebuild it, rebuild the droid. So the Mandalorian flies off into space in his Naboo cruiser to finally go to, well, according to the chapter title, Chapter 18, The Minds of Mandalore. So the Mandalorian gets the astromech droid from Tatooine and that allows him to navigate to Mandalore and they discuss how Mandalore used to be beautiful. It used to have a lot of scenery but time and you know it's war torn now so it's not going to be the same experience as it would have been back in the day. He sends R5 to do the scouting and then he sort of adjusts his helmet. He pressurizes it so he can breathe oxygen because the whole purpose of R5 was to test the oxygen to make sure it was still breathable from humanoid, I guess you can say, lungs. And um, it's interesting because this scene, it, it almost looked a little bit like sort of Exegol a little bit, like the where the throne was at. I don't know if they were going for that, but it definitely is not what I was expecting from the planet Mandalore at all. You know what I mean? Going into this. He gets into this big three-on-one fight with these, like, beasts, these humanoid, like, Wendigos almost they were, right? And he wields the Darksaber, but he's not that adept at wielding it, but it, it's trying to do the job for him. But I really like this fight scene in the caverns. I enjoyed it. It's the first real fight scene of the season, and it was cool. So it's confirmed that the air is breathable and thus he and Grogu, Grogu's on this little like space pod that kind of looks like Frieza's ship but it's small for him. They both decide to go through a cave to try to find that, uh, that sacred water he has to bathe in. So Mando gets trapped by what I describe to be like a giant spider robot. And then a smaller droid comes out of this robot from within that... Reminds me of General Grievous for some reason. Maybe it's the same idea. So Grogu becomes the hero here for this part of the episode, trying to force, trying to use the force to save Din, but he yells at him to get Bo Katan. So Grogu uh, at one point is confronted by the monsters from earlier as he's trying to escape the mines, and he uses the force push to push it out of the way, then jumps on Mando's ship and goes to escape. So Grogu goes to Bo-Katan's place. She gets the data from the R5 unit and takes Din's ship and flies to Mandalore trying to, you know, save the guy. Even though it felt like she was trying to do something worse to him before. You know, take him out or whatever. Maybe she wants the Darksaber. I don't know. 
So Bo-Katan and Grogu go into the mine, and Bo-Katan kind of becomes the de facto new main character here, even though I guess you could say it's Grogu. She takes out the monsters that were seen earlier that Mando fought, and I think she called them Alamites. Uh, if there's something, so, if there's some creature from some like EU stuff or, you know, some like Legends book or something from the recent canon stuff that Star Wars put out, I haven't heard of it. This is my first time ever hearing about these things. So they remind me kind of like the Morlocks from the Time Machine. You ever read or seen the movie from, uh, from H.G. Wells? He wrote the book, The Time Machine. How in the future there's like regular surface dwellers and there's Morlocks. Their story is even similar to the Morlocks. So there's no question there's probably inspiration here. So Bo-Katan ends up fighting that, you know, grievous looking thing. And she whips out the Darksaber because it was lying there. And she knows how to use that Darksaber, let me tell you. She was swinging that thing around like she had been practicing for years and the actress probably did practice but or you know whoever's in the suit could be a stunt person probably is um just swinging it around like nothing is able to defeat this thing kill it and then go try to save mando just then he goes behind you and then that big spider robot turns out that it's not just a vehicle for the smaller droid it is a droid and it attacks bo katan so she whips out that dark saber and we have us another great fight so Bo and Din have like a discussion about, you know, the supposed magic water. She's kind of a non-believer and he kind of gives her this spiel about how the Mandalorians are like stars in the galaxy. They're spread out and the creed that they have is what kept them together. I like this stuff. I'll, I'll be honest, yo, a long time ago during the era of like Rebels, I wasn't really into the Mandalorian lore at all. I really wasn't. I thought it was just kind of extra. I was really more into Jedi and Sith and like that kind of stuff, you know, because I love that, the force, the duality of it, the Buddhist inspirations. I love it. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. But now with the Mandalorians, they're almost like this holy group of knights, you know, these like Jedi, except not. Um, and they have their own sort of issues that were, kind of ripped apart thanks to the Empire, you know, and I really like how they have their own story, and I'm more in it now thanks to this show, not this episode, but the previous couple of seasons, uh, this was a good episode though, but this show has really ignited my love for the Mandalorian lore and their creed, you know, it's great. So she takes him to the living waters, and I'm like, wait a minute, hold up, are we already going to resolve this plot point now? Is this not going to be the plot of the rest of the season? Because that's what I had thought. They would spend the entire season with Mando, or maybe half of it, trying to figure out just what to do. But he's already there. So is the quest finished? Interesting. So he unfastens his belt and takes off all his weapons and things like that. But he walks into the water. Like, it's like a little lake, like an underground lake. He walks into the water with his armor on, which I was not expecting. I thought they were going to have him, like, basically become Pedro Pascal. But that's not what happened here. He came in with the water, with the armor and the helmet. I guess that makes more sense for the Mandalorian people and how much they covet their identity. So the episode ends with Mando being pulled down under the water by what looks like some kind of sea creature or something. Like a big sea creature. Bogotan goes in after him. She does manage to save him and pull him back out of the water, which I thought they were going to hold that off till the beginning of next week. That would have been a better idea, in my opinion. But um, that's the cliffhanger. They're both, you know, next to the water, breathing hard, in shock of what they just saw. And now, where do we go from here? Very interesting. The show's getting better. I like this episode significantly more than I did the previous few episodes. It was a lot of fun, and um, we got to see more action. The story actually progressed much faster than I thought, and they got me hooked and intrigued about what's coming next for this show, because who knows what they have planned for this season. There's some clips out there, but, you know, like the trailer, but it doesn't really give everything away, you know? So, overall, this was a thumbs up episode. I enjoyed it. Mandalorian is still cooking with goodness. What did you think? Let me know. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.